So this week, we call Palm Sunday. Some of your friends in other uh, mainline Protestant denomination churches may call this Sunday Passion Sunday. We're given the option as pastors, as worship teams, as leaders, uh, to sort of choose between how we want this week to play out. And so some churches choose to pack in um, a, a very long scripture reading that is called the Passion uh, story of Christ. So it's sort of, uh, depending on what gospel you're in, it just reads through the last few days of Christ's life. It starts with uh, the, the, the scene in the upper room. It moves to the garden, to the arrest, to the betrayal, to, to all of that leading up to the cross. And, and people choose to read that on this Sunday with the assumption that you're not going to come back to hear that story on Monday, Thursday, or on Good Friday. And so they, they try and pack it all in on the Sunday so that, that, that you at least hear that story before the following Sunday in which you celebrate, we gather to celebrate Easter together. Because you can't really fully, truly celebrate Easter unless you're willing to walk through Good Friday. Unless you're willing to, to stand and sit before the cross. It just sort of, it, it, it just doesn't uh, really mean as much. But I've always loved this Sunday to be Palm Sunday for us. Mainly because some of you, most of you, come back. Um, our, our, our Good Friday service always typically has about 100, 120, 130 people in it. And so um, it's a service that, that people here love. Our Monday, Thursday service is a little newer, and so it's not as, as well attended. But, but most of you come back for Good Friday. So, so for that reason alone, I love us to, to simply sit in this uh, Palm Sunday um, s service or, or, or scripture reading. And this year, the scripture reading comes from Mark's gospel. And so um, I invite you to hear uh, the gospel of Mark, the 11th chapter, uh, beginning with the first verse. And, and this, is, this is what we find. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage in Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, this is Jesus sending his disciples, go into the village ahead of you and immediately as you enter it, you will find there tied a, don a colt that has never been written, un ridden, untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the city. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that, were, that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven." Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. May God add God's blessing to the reading, to the hearing, to the understanding of God's holy word. Thanks be to God. Amen. So, what is the, what is the first thing you think about when you hear the word parade? I mean, obviously the kids had their sort of uh, thoughts that, that they had when it came to a parade. Some of them, I'm not sure if, if, if all of them had attended a parade before, but, but what are the first things that come to our mind? For me, it's always a holiday, right? I mean, we, I think Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade and, and watching that on TV and seeing the, the big floats and, and, and maybe it's the, the, the fact of being home with family and friends around that, that to, to be able to watch that. It seems like Charleston has an inordinate number of parades. Um, Park Circle in particular, like they, they're, people are just always looking for a reason to walk around the circle, I think. Um, we have a lot of parades down here. But, but all of these are sort of a, a, a commemoration of something, of an instance, whether it's a, 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 a festival, a holiday, uh, whatever the, the reason uh, may be, there always seems to be, to be a theme behind these parades. 
Some of you actually may have, may have thought um, a, 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 of a different way, uh, more of a, of a victory parade, um, especially when it comes to sort of a sports team. Anybody's sports team that, that wins a, a, a championship, whatever sport that might be, and, and you think of a, a ticker tape parade and people throwing confetti and um, I, I recently read a, a why that is called a ticker tape parade, and, and, and uh, that's way before uh, all, any of our times, but, but still, it, this, this celebratory tone. And so it's, it's sort of a celebrating the heroes coming home. Um, I'm hoping that we'll have a, one of those in, in Durham in a couple of weeks when, when they... Ah, uh, okay. I had to get my shot in somewhere. I, I'm not going to say any more. I'm done. Um, this parade that we have to celebrate these heroes that, that return home, sports teams, this all comes from antiquity. This comes from, from if you think back to, to the, the invading army has, has gone out and has conquered and has succeeded and they come home to, to much fanfare, to much celebration. Um, I, in my mind, I go to the scene in, in Gladiator. I don't know if you're familiar with that movie, a pretty, pretty gruesome, gruesome movie, but, but at the very beginning, the, 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 the Roman army has gone and has conquered and vanquished the foe, and, and they're returning back with a new Caesar, and, and the people are lining the streets, and, and there's much fanfare, and probably those people were forced to be there, um, but, but they're there to, to celebrate their, their hero returning. But in all of these cases, whether it's history or, or our present day form, it, it's an act of celebrating an accomplishment, right? I mean, you don't have a parade um, for just any old reason. You're celebrating something. I've always wanted to, to go to a, a big city when they win a, a championship of a, in a major sports event just, just so that I could see it, to be a part of it. I almost flew to Boston in 2004. I almost did. Um, to celebrate that. But, but it, I, I just wanted to be there, to be amongst the crowd, to see what it was like. Because it's a sense of accomplishment, success, right? So it stands for us to reason that on this Sunday, as we, as we start Lent, as we set this time apart to, to call this Palm Sunday, that as we begin our, our yearly journey towards, towards Holy Week, that this parade that we sort of walked around with the kids and we just read about this parade, it seems to me that it's out of place. Have you ever thought about this? I mean, this, this parade that breaks out for Jesus, it, it's kind of out of place. Now, the historical records that we have, that the people who do this for a living, that, that research and do history, have told us that, that no fewer than 12 other people before Jesus would have had a parade like this. 12 other people. I mean, you can, you can look this up and you can find their names. Um, um, Judas Maccabees had it, had it twice. Twice they celebrated this guy coming back. And each time these 12 people had done something amazing or they were the king, newly in charge, newly crowned, and they're coming into this, this small little town in the corner of, of, of the Middle East, um, this little tiny province, and, and people are celebrating them. 12 times this has happened before Jesus comes in. And so here Jesus comes in, probably with, with a little less fanfare. He's a little bit more obscure than the most of these, these people. I mean, Jesus is a rabbi. He's a teacher. He's a healer. Word had gotten around amongst us, the common people, that, that Jesus was doing some cool stuff. And so people wanted to, to sort of see that. But yet he had not been a conquering hero in traditional terms. So this parade breaks out. Now surely he was, again, popular amongst the common people, but he had not done anything. He lacked the pedigree to have a parade. In fact, we believe that, that there were probably a lot fewer people at this parade than we first imagined. Because you, you think of a parade, you think of a lot of people gathering. There probably wasn't that many people at this parade. Simply because at the same time on the other side of the city, whichever side you're on, there was another parade going on. You see, Pontius Pilate had decided that as the Passover came near, the same reason that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, Pontius Pilate said, I better go to Jerusalem too because I'm getting wind that, that something might be up. 
something's amiss in this little tiny town. And all these people flood into Jerusalem. And, and whenever you get a large group of people around, um, you know, there's a possibility that danger could occur. I, that's the reason I don't run the bridge run. I had 36,000 people yesterday. That sort of makes my skin crawl a little bit to even think about being on a bridge with all those people. You gather a lot of people together, you just never know what's going to happen. Well, Pilate knew this. And so Pilate decides, I'm going to leave my home, which was in Caesarea, near the coast. He had this nice little cushy place to live. And so he decides he's going to move from that place and go to Jerusalem for this event, simply as a reminder to the Jews, because he did not want them to forget that he was in charge. Right? Like, he didn't want them to forget or to get any kind of revolutionary ideas that maybe they should do something different. He wanted to remind them that Rome was still in charge. So Pilate comes into town, and when Pilate comes to town, now we're talking about a party. I mean, now we're talking about a parade. I mean, you're talking about big, massive horses. You're talking about them forcing people to be there. Anybody who was anybody was going to, you know, if you were were sort of jockeying for position, prestige, or power, if you were somebody who'd been there all your life and you wanted to sort of stand out, the who's who, we're going to show up to Pilate's parade. And and Pilate would have been coming in from the west. He would have been coming in from from the side where where the Mediterranean Sea is. He would have been coming in from that way, whereas Jesus was coming in from the east side of town. No no comment on on judgment on east versus west or anything like that. He's, He's coming in from the east simply because that's where the Mount of Olives was. And the Mount of Olives was known as Little Galilee back then. Because that's where, when Passover rolled around, all the Galileans would come down from Galilee and they would gather there on the Mount of Olives. And it would sort of be their little, little community. And they would, they would spend a few days together, sort of huddled together before they went into the big city of Jerusalem. And so he's there on the Mount of Olives coming in from the east. And, and these people who would have followed him, people that would have been a lot like you and I, common, ordinary, everyday people, Gentiles, some Jews, mostly from Galilee, would have started hearing and seeing what was happening and they would have gotten excited. And so they start following following Jesus in. So on the one hand, you have a competing, like he didn't have any pedigree, he doesn't have anything, reason to to be celebrated as a parade. But then on the other hand, on the other hand, is this whole idea of Jesus being a victorious figure. Jesus being a victorious figure, not in the ways in which you and I and the people back then would understand victory. You see, that kind of victory didn't fit into what God had in store for God's people. See, remember, when the people, and even the disciples, claimed that Jesus would be the Messiah, in their mind, they had the conquest of this champion warrior riding in on a big, large horse that would rule through violence, through force, not through the shedding of his own blood. Now, remember, the people are are shouting as he comes in, and and blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. This is what the people say. And for us, that's just sort of a little phrase that we find in a psalm, but but the meaning behind this is, N.T. Wright tells us, he says, they are thinking back a thousand years to the time in which Israel was truly great, when the surrounding nations were repelled in the independent kingdom of David, and then his son Solomon, when it extended further than ever before or since, that's what they want. And in a few days, We find that when it appears that Jesus is anything but that, anything but a conquering hero, the cries of Hosanna quickly turn to cries of, to crucify. Oh, people are fickle, aren't they? And we are people, aren't we? I mean, if we're honest, we're no different. I mean, we read in James that that we too have the same tongue, that powerful instrument that's in our mouth that, that can both spew blessing, but then also spew curse. 
when we have expectations, like they did, and when those expectations are not met, then disappointment leads to words or actions that are anything but holy. This is never more clear to us than in these five days that quickly go from a donkey and palm branches instead to a cross and a crown of thorns. And so maybe today's lesson is yet again about what we talked about last week. For those of you who are here, we talked about expectations. That maybe our expectations when it comes to our faith Uh, our life in in faith together maybe our expectations on on how we look at the world and and what we expect to happen maybe those need to be adjusted a bit maybe we should maybe we should should probably quit expecting God to act like us you ever thought about that like do we expect God to act like us God I hope not because we act stupid sometimes. Right? I mean, I hope not all the time, but sometimes. And maybe we should acknowledge that, well, maybe we acknowledge that God, God's way for us is, is through love and peace and forgiveness instead of through force power vengeance maybe and and this would be revolutionary maybe it's it's that we realize that that Jesus never requires us or wants us to vanquish our enemy like the people did at that parade that the only way that Jesus ever spoke to us about our enemy was for us to love And that's hard. And I don't want to do it sometimes. And yet again, I'm reminded, I'm thankful that God is not like me. So friends, as we walk through this next week, through Holy Week, through a a week that ends in utter darkness, may we come to terms with the fact that the real enemy, the real enemy that all of humanity has ever faced from the beginning of the time, the one that all of us will, all, will, will face at some point ourselves, the real enemy being death, that that enemy has once and for all been defeated. And by that enemy being defeated, that frees us. We are free, you and I, to live our lives abundantly and un afraid abundantly and unafraid hear me say this again unafraid I am tired of seeing fear rule our world because of the sacrifice of Christ because of what this first step leads to the next step in which we find ourselves face to face with Christ on the cross then we get to celebrate we can't do it yet but then we get to to see the celebration that'll come on Easter Sunday and I don't know about you but I think I think that might warrant a parade amen amen